Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us at TESS. Just some housekeeping items before we forget, before we begin. Please introduce yourself in the chat before you do. Make sure you set the blue box to all panelists and all attendees. You can use the question and answer feature to ask any questions. You can also upvote or comment on questions. We'll have 15 minutes at the end of this presentation for questions around 1.45. Your microphone is muted upon entry and your video is disabled upon entry. Uh, please use the closed captioning button on the bottom panel to enable closed captioning. And this session is going to be recorded. So today we have a very special guest joining us, Amira Dalla. Amira has spent over a decade in technology working on issues related to digital rights, education, privacy, and equity with global organizations and communities. Together, she works with educators and activists to design participatory curriculum and resources to make emerging technology more inclusive, open, and safe. She currently works at Consumer Reports as the Associate Director of Engagement focused on issues like digital privacy, which allow her to give people the skills and tools to protect themselves in our increasingly digital lives. Previously, she spent six years working at Mozilla Foundation as the lead of education, gender, and global programs, where she focused on creating an accessible, safe, open and innovative web for people around the world. Among her work, she has developed digital education programs in over 100 countries and collaborated on programs with UN Women, Ford Foundation, the World Economic Forum, US State's Department, and the government of Rwanda, as well as others. She recently completed her master's in public administration at Columbia University, focusing on the intersection of human rights and technology. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Amira Zala. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lithia. Um, hi, everyone. As you've heard, my name is Amira Dalla. I'm calling in from the Lenape Island of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. And while I'm calling in from New York, I'm proud to have grown up in Toronto, to graduate from Wilfrid Laurier University. And often, I'm most proud of my mom, who I get to have discussions around equity and inclusion in her role at University of Toronto. I'm here today to talk about the big shift. So how do we transfer connection, empathy, inclusion, and engagement in learning environments, particularly in this moment that we're all living in together? And before I jump in, I wanna say thank you to eCampus Ontario for hosting this event and providing us a space to talk about important issues such as humanizing learning. And I wanna recognize you, the people who have showed up today and have showed up in your schools the last year. When I first saw this tweet, it stuck with me. It reads from the admin in 2020 and it says, please be prepared to teach online, in person, both simultaneously on a moving train while juggling in a burning building under the sea, during a wrestling match with a T-Rex as a hologram and riding a unicorn. Also, be safe and we value you. <laughs> the wrestling match with a T-Rex, it gets me every time. Um, maybe this, this tweet might resonate for you as well, but the energy that I'm feeling already from this event and the community is a true testament that educators are the real superheroes. And despite gloomy times, they consistently show up as the most eager to learn at any event that I ever, had, I ever go to, to be honest. And while I'm honored to be sharing some of what I've learned here with you today, I know that there is a lot that I can learn from this incredible community as well. So thank you for the work you are doing. It is incredibly important. I'm gonna start with the shifts that I talked about and I start with the story of March. So March indicated a shift for us all. And I'm gonna share three big shifts in my life and how I adapted. 
Adapting in these three spaces looks so differently. And if you have ways or methods in which you have used when adapting, I encourage you to share them with myself and others using the chat method, and I'm excited to see what came up for you all. But in March, my time was centered around three things, my work, my volunteering, and my school. And I'm gonna break all three of these down. We're gonna start with my work. So I'm a technologist by trait with a focus in digital engagement and security. I currently work at an organization called Consumer Reports. Previous to that, I worked at Columbia University's technology and media program, and I worked at Mozilla Foundation. My current work at Consumer Reports, it focuses on bringing people together to take action around big issues such as digital rights and privacy, issues that are really important to me. And once the pandemic hit, we can no longer support our then existing model of physical spaces for people to gather and learn and share, and our organization went remote. This might sound familiar because it's kind of the story for so many of us in so many industries. So when thinking back to the issues that came up, there were tons of questions we had to pose. Here are examples of some of the questions. They really focused on how do we transfer the offline education to the online education? And how do we make sure that people feel welcome, that they feel safe, that they feel included when they were doing so and showing up to these spaces? And above all else, how do we know and make them feel like they can have the impact they want on the issues they care about, on the issues we knew they cared about and the issues that were so important in the world today. And of course, it was how do we do this as soon as possible? So we were literally scrambling to figure out what we could do in the next day, the next month, the next, the next week, the next year, all of these issues were coming up. What was realistic and what could we do and when? And so when it comes to adapting, there's a few things I wanna talk about with this group and highlight things that came up for us. The first is that we had to focus on shifting everything virtually. All of our events, all of our programming, all of our resources, we quickly put them online. We made it an open system for people to come and grab what they need and do it in their local communities in a virtual and safe setting. So one of the things I was really excited to lead was our virtual workshop series on digital wellness, in which we taught individuals how to stay safe online by digital security and privacy tips that we would teach in an hour long workshop. We started with just a few hundred people, and by now we have thousands of people showing up every month. And by starting small and growing, we've been able to constantly think about how we can adapt and change it for more voices and more people showing up all while coming from the comfort of their own home. We've also been experimenting with new ways on how to engage people. And this is something we're constantly doing and constantly thinking about. It's not a one-off, one-done, we launched this thing, it's a great new way. It's how do we constantly reinvent the wheel and add new offerings that people can do from the comfort of their home. So one of the ways we've been pushing through on this is our research studies. People can submit the results of water quality tests that they do in their homes from their kitchen sinks, or they can test their internet speeds on their computers. And they can send us all these results and be a part of our research and reporting that we do at Consumer Reports, which not only makes it so much richer in content, but it's actually bringing in all these people to feel more connected to the work. And throughout all of these programs, all of these things that we're doing, it's really important to me to improve the feedback loops. And so we're doing this with surveying and conversations and informal feedback sessions where we ask people, what did you learn and how did you learn? And in doing this, we can feed that feedback in and make sure that it's a continuous loop that we're better serving the people around us. And also it's really important to focus on timely issues that are relevant to the people. We know that people are living in the moment. It's our job to catch them there. And we know that things like video conferencing security in March and April were so important to people, especially those coming online for the first time, using them to teach and having to monitor and hold that power. And so we launched months of programming surrounded on how do you pick the best video conferencing? Which one is the best for your specific needs? What do you do to stay safe on it? What are the settings you might need to change? And what are the things you might not know about that you can control 
that make it a safer environment for those who show up in. And so that's all been really exciting. And while we've been doing all that, we're continuously trying to improve the access, whether it's in groups or in small spaces or individuals where people can share and connect with each other. So we're doing this in a few ways. We've launched more applications on our site, more ways to plug into the programming so that when people get there, they know what they're capable of doing. And we're developing new community spaces, especially for groups that gather around some of our new projects like research studies. And above all else, we're continuously testing. We're testing new events that could allow for smaller groups leading to more intimate discussions. So on the one hand, we have these thousand people groups that are coming every month, that are showing up really excited um, and that they're participating. But we realized it really is nice to come to a place where you can have a voice in the call. And to do that, we set the marker at 100 people per event. And so now we're balancing and testing out different models to feel what is more impactful for our audience. And so that's the first shift. The second shift we're gonna look at is volunteering. So in my personal and professional setting, I volunteer a lot with communities in developing curriculum, teaching and learning, and designing engaging spaces for distributed communities. One of the endeavors that I was really excited to take on in this time was teaching a short course on digital advocacy, design thinking, and digital education to youth ages 14 to 17 from around the world. As you can imagine, ages 14 to 17 was a lot different than the audience I have at work. And that meant there was a lot of things that were coming up to us, especially given their global um, complexity, that meant it was a really different audience to teach in front of. And so the questions and things that came up for me are really displayed here. And the largest one was access to technology. You would have students all the time sharing devices with their families, their friends, people around them in their homes that are constantly needing to give and take in terms of, okay, you can have this for 20 minutes, I'll get it for the next half hour. And because we had such a distributed group in so many different places, we had so many connection issues of people calling in from different locations. And so we had slow video, we had audio not working. And even with this, we had so much lack of, of presence when people were showing up in the place. A general hesitancy on how do I engage? How do I talk? I feel too shy to talk about these things in front of my peers. And that was really hard for us to figure out how to engage and get people talking that were not just myself. Um, Cause that is never fun when you're teaching. And as a result of all of these issues, we learned that we also had disruptive behavior that was not always fun. So in the chat, there was occasional name calling. And if you're not having lots of information in the chat or conversation, the name calling just really stuck out. And then sometimes we'd have takeovers of screens when presenting, and it wasn't something that any of us enjoyed being around. And despite all of these issues, we also realized there was a low clarity in the course. I know that individuals read the course description before they joined, but when they showed up, they were still unclear of where we were going and what we were gonna create and learn together. And so here's a real life image of some of the students in my class. I imagine that SpongeBob is the parent in the background saying, hey, can I use that computer in 20 minutes? So when it comes to adapting, there are a bunch of things that I reflected on and was able to take away. And the first one was developing some ground rules for the students. Together, we created a shared agreement of how we wanted to show up. And we didn't just do it one time. We actually made it an iterative process so that we were always adding to it and we were always revisiting it. In fact, we talked about the shared agreements and reviewed them at the beginning of every single class. So we were reminded of what we created around how we wanted to show up for ourselves and for each other. Making it a continuous process was really important. We also focused on how to make the curriculum more lo-fi. So given the internet issues, I integrated more activities that didn't strain people's internet. So some of the fun activities that I did were silent writing activities, where we could all be online at the same time and we would just sit here with our notebooks, videos on if you could, and we would just be writing ideas and reflections and thoughts. And then we'd come together and it would be encouraged to share some of the ways you're feeling it. But it gave us a break from the computer. It didn't strain our, our internet as much as we would have wanted. And it gave us some moments to collect our thoughts. And that was really important for this group. 
we also focused on what were the spaces people want to show up in. So we really learned that they truly did not love the, the Zoom chat. But when asked where they wanted to show up in, they loved WhatsApp. It was somewhere they were comfortable with, they felt safe, they use it a lot, they know what to do. And so we created a WhatsApp group. And within the WhatsApp group, the conversation just started flowing. And so even while I'm teaching, the Zoom chat is literally right there. But lo and behold, the WhatsApp chat would be where the conversation had because that's where they felt comfortable. And then amidst all this, we also use small breakout groups. I know this is something some of you experimented a lot with, but we've done one-on-one -on -one to make sure that there's safe, smaller spaces for people to share and engage with each other. And it forced them to discuss the issues, to support each other. So we would do a one to two or even three in some classes, one-on-one -on -one breakouts and then multiple other breakouts as well. And then it was really important to give students the ability to pick their own topics or issues. So it was important for me to figure out how to rally students around something they cared about. So they would be invested in the work and would show up excited to learn every time. And not surprisingly, students developed issues and topics related to things they cared about. So bullying, COVID-19 in their community and Black Lives Matters. And amidst all of this, we focused really hard on setting the expectations for each class. So at the beginning of each class, we reviewed what we were gonna do that class. At the end of each class, we reviewed what we had done and we reviewed what we were gonna do the next class. And then we reviewed how this fit into the bigger picture. So talking about all this would lead to that big project they were creating and it would really help them see how do I navigate all this content and curriculum and where is it actually going? And what is my role in creating the space and the things I need to get there? And so that was really important. And the third shift that I'm gonna talk about is school. So at this time, I was getting my master's from Columbia University, an MPA focused on human rights and technology. And like so many of students, so many of my peers, I would log into my class every day. I would join in on my class, I'd attend virtual events, and any sort of workshops or gathering that I could get by the school, constantly figuring out what, was their, what were they providing, how are they looking out for us, and what was happening. And there's a lot of things I wanna talk about when it comes to the engagement part and how we struggled. And I'm gonna spend a, a little bit more time here because I think it's really important specifically to this community. And so I wanna start by saying, there were no norms or practices on how to engage. I found that there was no shared understanding on how to treat each other, create spaces for each other to share or identify our own needs or even fulfill them. And I found that really difficult. I found it really hard to communicate what I needed. So in person, you have office hours, you have after class to talk to students and professors, or you even had these side conversations. You never knew were that helpful. And online, there was just this, this structured box. And that made it really hard, hard to ask questions, compare ideas with other students, to get clarifications when I needed it. And I was getting really lost. And amidst all that, I couldn't help but feel we lost what connected us. I felt further from the people I was used to being around. And even though we would try to keep up in chats and discussions, it proved really challenging. So until then, many of us were writing to each other in the chats and Zoom, sending private messages. We have a general comfortability with using these technology tools. But I remember the moment that someone had learned that our professor would get a copy of private chat messages after the class. And it was just like that, that moment, that everyone stopped messaging. Even with the uncertainty of it being true, I don't know if we ever proved that was, it was true, but we definitely proved that the professor gets a chat, a, a chat role after the class. No one wanted to risk that. No one wanted our intimate moments of checking on each other's health, making sure we're okay, asking questions we might've thought were dumb to be seen by anyone else. And so we just got totally disconnected. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit this next point, but it felt okay to not be prepared. 
disengaging online was far less obvious and scary than it was in person. In person, I held myself to a high standard of doing my readings, of making sure my work was done and being prepared just enough to make sure that I could participate. But all of that changed when I went online and it was easier to not prepare myself to the standards that I had at once held myself to. And I started to feel like others weren't as well. And it was really easy because the social constructs all around us were just, they were just falling down. And so this just felt like a natural part of what was happening for all of us. And it felt okay to give this up a little. And the last point I wanna focus on here because this took a lot of reflecting and a lot of thought as I figured out what had happened in the last few months and how schooling went, but my experience centered entirely on me. So in person, I could rely on my peers and the environment for support. But online, I was the center of everything that happened and everything that did not happen. And that required me to take on this new weight, this new role as a student that I wasn't prepared for and that I didn't even realize was happening. And so that was really important for me to realize that and then realize what that meant if I wanted to move forward in this role. And I would be remiss to not say that there was a lot happening in the world. There still is. And navigating the world was the most challenging class that any of us had ever been in. And so here's a snapshot of what my Zoom classes looked like when I first joined, or at least this is what I thought they looked like in my head, sort of something like this. And when it comes to adapting, it's a lot tougher for me to describe this because honestly, truly with you all, I have to say that I don't know if I fully adapted. And after talking with friends, it feels like the adaptation has come more now than it ever did in the spring term. And that's okay, that makes sense because these things, they take time to figure out. But at that moment, that time and place, I felt like I was not in control of how my learning transferred online. I didn't get to construct spaces, to give feedback, to support those around me, to get that support that I really, really needed. And on the one hand, it felt like I was gaining hours back in my day. And for a busy person like myself, you know, that initially felt great, but I felt disconnected from my peers, the people around me, the students, the professors, the irreplaceable learning that comes from being on that campus. And at that point, I was actually really critical of my own attention. My attention was constantly shifting with what was happening in the world. It was more reactive to what was happening in the moment. And I had to tell myself that that was okay. That in that moment, I was just trying to survive. And by thinking that through, and learning and sharing that and reflecting, I began to have a little bit more empathy for myself, for my peers, my professors, and all of those involved. Okay, we made it to May. By May, I was burnt out, I was zoomed out, and regardless of all this screen time, I felt pretty alone. My digital, my professional, my student life, had all just sort of blended into one in my small apartment in Manhattan. I would spend on average 10 hours a day on my 11 inch laptop screen in meetings and classes, connecting with friends, assuring my family that I was okay and doing my homework whenever I could. And in this month, it also marked my graduation. It's a great moment. I broke my record of how many hours on Zoom with a record break in 14 hours on Zoom celebrations, all alone from my tiny apartment right in the seat. Um, I did that and I, I watched recordings on hours from the administration. I organized a celebration with my friends. I did a celebration with my family in Toronto who was supposed to fly in for the ceremony. I did a couple more celebrations and a final toast in the evening where I was asked to say a speech to the graduating class. But amidst all of this, 
all of what was supposed to be a joyful moment, I was in a pandemic low, like so many others around me have felt. So if we go back to that Zoom call, I'm that pug deep down there in the corner. And the reason I bring this up today is because we don't often talk about what healing looks like for educators and students. And while I hear of what some schools are doing for students, how they're offering sessions and open office hours and others, I wonder how often they're doing that for professors and faculty as well. For me, I constantly feel heavy. I'm tired from all the things around me. And the reason I wanna highlight this is because I can acknowledge the moment my mental health was in a critical state. And the mental health of students, of educators, of yourselves, it's critical in this time. And whether it's now or later, the situation is gonna have an impact on all of us. And it's our job not to dismiss that moment, but to give yourself time that you need to heal. So check in on yourself because healing is radical. Healing is an act of self-love. Healing makes us better to all of those around us. And if you ask yourself how you are and your response is similar to Ross's Geller's in this picture, it's kind of like a squeaky, like I'm fine, then, then this is for you, I think. Um, I had to do this often in May. I had to keep breathing, reminding myself to breathe. I had to check in on myself. I had to inquire and make sure others checked in on me too. And there's just so much around me in that time. So with all of this, all of this May that I told you, I wanna pause here and I wanna invite you to take that collective breath with me. We're gonna inhale for five seconds and we're gonna exhale for five. So on the count of three, we'll start. One, two, three. And then exhale. Okay, shake it off. Shake off May, shake off these times. I know it's hard. We need to take moments to breathe and we need to take moments to check in. So how are we feeling? You, how are you feeling? But, but really, how are you feeling? These are the questions I need you to check in on. These are the questions that we need to remind ourselves. Sometimes it's scheduling it in our own calendar. Sometimes it's reminding a peer, but these are the problems and the issues that I want us to continuously be talking about. And checking in, I need a sip of my tea, so give me one second. Okay. So some of you might already be aware of what the term healing, and some of you might even be practicing it, which is great, but I just wanna make sure to highlight some of the ways that this could look like for individuals because it looks differently for everyone. So when I talk about healing, I mean, are you eating healthy? Are you exercising? Are you regularly sleeping? Are you meditating, relaxing, getting a massage that I know that you want or you need? Are you journaling, self-reflection? Are you picking up hobbies? Are you spending time amongst the beautiful leaves in this fall, autumn time? Are you picking up a book or learning a new skill? Are you increasing your time with family and friends? Are you cuddling that pet that is so cute and I love seeing pictures of on social media? Are you loving yourself and are giving yourself boundaries like taking your break, saying no, being true to your vacation time? Are you talking to others about how you feel in this moment? These are so many ways, but truthfully, healing looks so different for everyone so it could be some of these, or it could be some of some other things altogether. And what we need can constantly change. But what I'm sure of in this moment, I am sure that the conversation on mental health, it has to continue and it has to be more integrated into how we talk about students having mental health, how we talk about professors having mental health and advisors and everyone involved in the ecosystem. Okay, we made it to June. So at this point, we all feel like we deserve a medal for weathering what was three months because that was a really long three months. I don't know about you all, but it just, it felt really long. And so in this time, 
I took some time off. I had less screen time. Part of my healing was knowing that I needed to give myself time to breathe. I slept a lot. I became a plant mom. I did a puzzle that I swear I will never do again because it was just too hard. I literally covered what some people call the pandemic bingo set. And in this time, I also took time to reflect on what had happened and what was happening around me. I wrote some notes about technology, education, and the pandemic, some of those things that I wanna share with you now. And so I've always been a really firm believer, and I believe many of you are here as well, that education and internet is a right. Both of them are proportional to our ability to get more resources and opportunities but they're not the reality for everyone. And in fact, this means that we have so much work to do because there's still so many barriers to access, to understanding, to our virtual world, largely fueled by issues like low resources, our belief that we all learn the same way and that once people get the tools, they always know how to best use them. And what is often so much more scarier for someone like myself is the intersection where technology and education are actually really harmful for some students and some people. And I wanna take you through an example. So this is a series of tweets. I know it's really small. I'm gonna go through what they say and then I'll read the last tweet, which I think is the most important. So this series of tweets is from a protest held by students at the University of Miami demanding safe and equitable pandemic planning just this last September. A few days after the protest, a handful of individuals were called into the Dean's office and they were given strict warnings around their behavior while protesting. And the last tweet, which I said is the most important, I'm gonna read it now. It says, disturbingly, when asked how this list of students was assembled, the Dean admitted to University of Miami's use of facial recognition surveillance software. I don't know about you, I have to breathe every time I read that because the intersection of technology and schools used in a way like this to surveil is frightening me. And it's largely where my research is based because it is most detrimental to our most vulnerable marginalized communities. So in this case, it's suppressing the voices of those who care about equity and often those who probably are facing the inequity at University of Miami. And it's true, we're in a race to implement technology. Schools being amongst the most advanced places that are pushing to get this technology through the door to implement it to become more leading edge and you are all in unique roles to use technology as a force for good, as a force for learning, constantly evaluating technology for the security and the rights of students. It's a role that you can take on and help encourage in your systems. So be having the conversations, talk about what you're bringing in and what does it mean? Talk about the pros and the cons so that you can have full discussions on what it means to bring in these products and how does it change student behavior and how are things like faculty and staff in the school gonna be using this technology. Another thing that I wanna share with you is this report done by the markup. So as you can see, there's a little bit of an image there with a bunch of countries on it. The markup did some research on countries around the world where it compared their cell phone prices compared to the data speeds on mobile devices. So as you can see in the US right there, where I am, it's a, it's a expensive and slow, but where my heart really drops is looking at Canada, where it's the most expensive and just a little less slower than most other countries. And while I'm only portraying mobile phones, it's indicative of the larger problem we have with internet costs in Canada, which affects the ability for students who struggle to get access and afford internet for their classes. All of this compiled, it really shows the greatest picture of we are in deep trouble when it comes to access here. 
The Canadian Journal of Communication, they did a study on how connected are Canadians. And in it, they found access to the internet disproportionately affected both senior citizens and disadvantaged segments. So those who are affected by low income or low education. And of those people who are not online, 20% claimed it was too costly. And an overwhelming over 20% claimed they just didn't have access to computers. So we're seeing this put together with this big picture and we do have a serious problem in Canada when it comes to our access and who's owning that access. Okay, so let's say we got online, we're online. It's not enough to get everyone there. What happens when people are there? I've done a lot of consulting in the past few months with a lot of organizations talking about how they've transferred their workplaces online. And in these conversations, I have asked, how much time and money did you invest in creating carefully curated physical spaces that were designed for openness and collaboration? And then I ask, how much time and money did you invest in doing that when you went online? And not surprisingly, they were always embarrassed by their answers. In the case of schools, it would be how much time and energy was spent into designing classrooms, to picking the perfect chair or desk, to spacing out a computer lab, to optimizing study spaces in the library. We spend so much time into thinking how to create open and appealing and accessible spaces physically, but we don't transfer that as often as we want to the virtual world. And the reason why that's important is because digital spaces, they are not inclusive by default. It takes a lot of work to design inclusion online. We can't just shift online and think the rules are the same, that the conversation will happen and that everyone will be involved. Most of these systems were built for one person to hold power, to control the space, to be speaking at a time. And as educators, we need to build ecosystems that let many people in, that disrupt the ways that these technologies are currently built or initially used. And I know as educators, it's hard to feel like you are in control of what the school does or, or that you don't have the resources or time to implement this in your classroom or in the school. So for the administrators present, this is where we need your help designing this process. This is where we need help of those who do have a seat at the table to stand up and actually bring more of us in to figure out how we can change all of this. And so amidst all of this, the conversations I've been having, I, I still feel that something is missing. With all of us entirely remote now, those missing pieces are feeling more evident than ever. Women are disproportionately suffering as a result of online learning and COVID because of the disproportional amount of housework, family care, and emotional care that they take on. Racial inequity is increasing and it's making it clear who is not connected. And income inequality, it's growing, which strains our digital needs, directly conflicting with our large costs of the internet and physical resources like computers. And amidst all this, I know we're missing things, people, and spaces. So this really brings me to how do we humanize learning? I thought a lot about this theme of the conference today, of the theme that is binding us. And I've been thinking about how do we create humanized digital spaces, especially in the ones that I've been working on creating. And I can't help but feel that I really want to focus on the word human and what it means to show up as an honest and authentic human. And doing so, we have to put people first. And there's four things that showed up for me that really came about that I wanna highlight here in which how we can put people first. And so the first one is deepening connection. We need to focus on how we're designing one-on-one -on -one or group discussions in the spaces we're showing up in so that we can build meaningful relationships in virtual settings. Most of the memories I've taken away from my undergrad and graduate degree, they were the people. And so we must center the people and create spaces for those connections to still be had, deepening the connections both 
with students, with professors, with mentors, with all of those in this ecosystem. And so I have two examples I wanna share here with you today. The first one is something you can practice in your classes and your labs, which have smaller groups. You can create introductory slides at the beginning of your courses. And what you do is you ask students to upload their picture, their, their themes, while they're, why they're there, the things that they value. And in doing so, have all the students share and view all of the students in the class. And in doing so, it builds a connection in your virtual classes and students can come together around themes that are identifying and cut across their different values. Another example is leveraging buddy systems and mentoring opportunities. It means also developing deeper connections between US academics and the people within the schools that you're with. And so here's an example, a consulting firm called Promazo has created the 100,000 Mentorship Challenge, which, which was built on the work of 40,000 students from 12 different universities over the summer. And it's kicking off just this month. So the goal is to connect 100,000 students with 100,000 mentors through this free app that you can see here in the slides, focusing specifically on underrepresented population, including students who are minorities, women, LGBTQ, veterans, and first generations. It's more than just putting people together, it's building connections, it's making sure to help students with their current questions and building out their future career path. The second thing I wanna talk about is being open for everyone. So sometimes we need to adjust the systems we're using and sometimes we need to just replace them. With all the conversations on anti-racism work in schools, it isn't just about inserting some diversity into the same protocols, the systems, and the institutional hierarchies. Sometimes it's about changing them all together. And we wanna talk about how are students part of that conversation? How are we tracking their feedback and implementing it going forward? So how are you engaging with minority students, with black students, indigenous students? What sort of feedback loops are you creating for them, both within the classrooms and the school, so they feel like their voice can be heard and they see their voice adding to the changes. I wanna acknowledge that this is often what is called the invisible work. It can feel undersupported and undervalued by so many. And this work really places the burden on those most affected by the system, marginalized people. So we need to talk about what it means to shift that power and have greater communication flows so we can change that just a little bit going forward. And the two examples I have for you to hear today, one is Teachly, which is a program created by Harvard Kennedy School professors, which it collects data on how often students participate in class, as well as how often professors call on any given student, helping professors identify participation gaps and encourage wider class participation. So this is a great example of taking a current system and adjusting it to allow more diversity and equity in the classroom. The next example I wanna walk through is a group of students at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, which started a new tradition by creating a more inclusive Hippocratic Oath to acknowledge racism, the coronavirus pandemic, and the killing of Breonna Taylor. For those of you that don't know, the symbolic white coat ceremony, it marks the beginning of an academic journey for students in medical, programs everywhere around the world, in the US specifically. It's a time when students accept their white medical coats and recite an oath vowing to be fair and ethical as they begin their medical education. As part of their orientation, first year students at this school were asked to challenge, were challenged by their dean to create a new class oath that acknowledged their ever evolving responsibilities as physicians, particularly as it was changing and evolving in this current time. And this is a great example of creating something entirely new and involving students in the process, having them help create the standards that they were gonna hold themselves to. So the third thing I wanna talk about is centering empathy. We need to allow spaces for a wide range of people to join the conversation, but it's not great if we're bringing them into hostile environments or places where they aren't able to share their stories not if you aren't truly listening to them and how they're being affected. Without compassion for ourselves and each other, we won't be able to get through this. 
So this is where I urge you, bring healing into the classroom. Be open to exploring what it looks like in your lives. Understanding that educators are all at different, different levels when it comes to technology with online learning, so we can figure out how to help each other. Empathy can lead to understanding and understanding can lead to action. It's also how we become better allies, particularly to students of color, indigenous students, LGBTQ students, and so many other groups around us. A particular example I wanna call out here is that the organization HKS put out an article on how universities design better student experiences during COVID-19 using empathy. So in the report, they outline how institutions can use personas, outlining different types of students which allow leadership and educators to put themselves into the shoes of different students and understand their needs. So this is an example of eight different personas they created, which included feedback and, and imaginary uh, information from students who are first year, who are graduate school in their last year and what their needs might look like. I'm gonna zoom into a particular profile. So this is Jin. In his profile and his persona, it highlights Jin's goals, his needs, his frustrations at any given moment. In his first year, he's not really familiar with campus He's worried about the resources he has, and he has low comfort with virtual learning. And amidst all this, he wants to meet his peers and learn more. Getting to know Jin can help build that empathy and understanding for how he feels and take it forward to these needs that he has. The fourth and final one that I wanna talk about is designing for engagement. So we're all tired of sitting at our screens, listening and watching. We need to make people the center of their own action. And we do this by games, case studies, group discussions, because as a student, I can testify that this encourages me to show up and learn, and it helps bring me closer to students while I do so. And we have this great thing called the internet and technology at our fingertips, and it's up to us to figure out how to leverage them. So find tools and activities that focus on participation from students while centering the security of those when they share on the devices. And then do this thing where you share it with your peers, share it with your community, share it right now here in the chat. Two quick examples I'm gonna bring up is first, this site called Poll Everywhere. Polls are really uh, popular in class. I know many of you have used them on Zoom, but these sort of polling ones like the one on Zoom really restrict audience responses to predefined multiple choice questions. So it could engage viewers, but it's usually temporary and superficial and it kind of gets old. So in contrast, tools like Poll Everywhere or Mentimeter, they prompt students to respond with an entire sentence through any internet connected device. In a real time browser, they can view the responses. The open-ended polls allow for more opinions, clusters of similarities or differences, and to have a classroom discussion and an actively exploring the topic at hand. The second tool I wanna to call out is Flipgrid. So this is a tool where you can get students to answer questions and discuss topics using video. It can help build trust among students, the class, encourage them to be creative, continue the discussion outside by asking questions like, what did we take away from this piece? Or how did I see this impacting my future? Or getting outside to view their neighborhood. So those were the four. And above all else, I wanna highlight that inclusion is not a straight path. We have to work with students and each other so that we can understand our experiences and design different spaces that reflect the values that I know this community cares so much about. It is in fact that the future is digital. And as we approach a world that becomes more invested in AI and algorithmic decisions, as it relies upon facial recognition to surveil, and provide touchless features amidst a pandemic, what we learn from each other, what we document online, who we forget, and the social rules we put together, they are all being used to develop the systems that shape our future. So we need to put rights and protection of students at the forefront and create models that are for us, by us, so that we can make them work for everyone. And above all else, I really believe in you, that you've got this, and I'm here to support you, and I know this community is as well. 
So thank you so much for joining today, for listening, for participating in the chats and questions. I've seen them go by. I'm eager to jump in myself. While people gather and I take a second to check them in, because we have 10 minutes for a q and I would love to hear from all of you on how you've adapted to humanizing education in this moment and what's, what's coming up for you. So feel free to share it in the chat. Let's keep the conversation going. And I'm just gonna search out a few of the questions that were asked uh, while people do so. Okay, so I'm headed into the chat. Okay, I, I see the most upvoted questions. I'm glad people are upvoting. Um, I, I, so I actually thought about this when I was gonna talk about it. The question asks about WhatsApp requiring phone numbers and that having a confidentiality restriction for classes. Um, and so I wanna clarify here, we did this in our setting uh, for this course that I taught online. Um, individuals were really eager to use WhatsApp. And in this case, we assessed the security and determined it was okay. Um, but I will say that none of my professors uh, were able to do this in the actual academic setting. And so that was something that is a little bit more questionable and I don't know if I would necessarily implement, but there are a lot of sites, a lot of room chats, a lot of other places that could potentially feel more confidential that use email login where people can gather. I know that WhatsApp is a place that particularly a lot of people are on, so it feels more comfortable, but how do we develop that comfortability and how do we develop that sort of creation of space and ecosystem where people can have it with them elsewhere? Um, okay, I'm gonna read another question. Um, it says, yeah, so lo-fi activities. Um, I, I know I love lo-fi activities as well. And thank you for picking up on that. This question specifically asks about any other uh, practical tips for creating lo-fi learning opportunities. And so there are so many versions of this. Um, I've created course uh, materials on potentially doing lo-fi internet-less activities uh, when I was teaching more about the internet, uh, particularly in other parts of the world where broadband access for us in those moments were nil to none. Um, and so I'm sure there's a community of people that can share. I know there are a lot of open resources on this, um, but in general, I recommend using activities where people are required to bring things to their computer, um, whether it's markers, whether it's paper, whether it's um, doing things that you can create, uh, you can do a lot with yarn. Um, a lot of lo-fi activities that I particularly love involve, um, involve doing things that are uh, with my hands. And so that to me is really important when we think of lo-fi, but it's also asking individuals to do things like video recordings outside of the classroom, outside of the time allocated so that they're participating, but not necessarily in a slotted time if their internet connection is a problem. So when they're able to find good internet, whether it's in spaces, whether it's in parking lots, um, they can then use that time to do more participatory sharing in a space that is like not as lo-fi constricting. Thank you. Okay, I'm reading through the next question. It's a little long, so give me just a couple seconds as I get through it. Um, it says virtual protocoling has been a sensitive subject as of late as institutions strive to assure the integrity of exams while honestly honoring the privacy and security concerns of students. Student-led petitions have proliferated across North America, objecting the use of virtual protocoling tools. And a major virtual protocoling vendor recently had an embarrassing security breach. So how should institutions and instructors communicate about virtual protocoling with students? This is a really, really important question. And I want to be honest and say that this is something that's much newer and is something that we're gonna have to learn and figure out together. Um, and so I don't have a perfect answer with this, but I can give you with my security hat on a few of the things that come to mind. Um, virtual protocoling where people are recording me on my screen and what I'm doing, um, it often does feel like an invasion, an invasion into my space my room, my bedroom for some people, um, in, into my computer. Uh, and that is worrisome for anyone. And when it comes to rights of privacy online, it's something we really have to consider. But I also know we wanna uphold these tests and these standards 
uh, to, the, to the degree that we have in the past. And so I would have conversations with students around it. This is where I would really center students as part of the conversation to say, we wanna do this, but we understand the security. Where can we meet each other in the middle and what feels safe and secure for you? Can you outline for us? What type of systems would allow people to do that? And then most important is the data that's being collected from all this. The most important part is really that proctoring vendor. Are they secure? Are they end-to-end -end encrypted? What are they doing? For students to sign in, is it multi-factored? How do we make sure, sure that it's the person who is doing so? What are all these things we need to have into place? And really, really clear outlining of what we're doing with this data, how we're using it, and probably the most important, how we're deleting it, who's watching it. All of those uncertainties really get at the part of which makes me uncomfortable thinking about that myself. So maybe understanding where students feel the most uncomfortable helps us get to the root of that and helps us potentially work with these organizations. So we can say, here's what students are saying or here's what they feel. How do we combat that with getting more, more protocols in place and more information and communication shared with them on what is actually happening to feel them, make them feel more safe when they're doing this. And so I think it is a give and get. And I think where we're seeing a lot more proctoring vendors show up, we need to hold them to a higher standards. This is students we're talking about. This is their security. This is actual data and content from their lives. And this is something we need to put at the highest level of both security, but our concern for that. Okay, I think I have time for a couple more questions and I see them still coming in, so thank you. Um, the next one I'm gonna read out is, how do we know as instructors we're missing the mark in terms of delivering programs that are inclusive and empathetic with students? How to assess and make prompt correction? Okay, so when it comes to inclusivity and empathy, I, I wanna call this out again, that these are consistently uh, evolving processes. It's not like we're inclusive once and then we're inclusive forever. This actually means we're all in a process of continuously learning and adapting the content and the work that we're around. And a lot of this goes back to how we're having conversations with students and how we're sharing that knowledge back and forth within the system, within our peers and the community. And so I would recommend having those feedback loops. How do you, ha do you have feedback loops that are for the entire class? I don't know about some of you, but at Columbia University, I had course evaluations at the beginning and at the end of the class. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure if they were effective and if I felt like they were the right feedback loop. I don't know if anyone read them. I don't know if anyone did anything about them. At the beginning of the class, I was like, sure, I think this class is great. And at the end of the class, I was like, oh, well, here's how I feel. But at the end of the class, it's a little too late. And so I would recommend doing things that are meaningful, that are a little bit outside of these constructed spaces that I feel like sometimes are not always secure. So having those conversations, making sure that they're throughout, whether they're surveys, one-on-ones or small group conversations, because we're only gonna learn this once talking to the communities that we know that we're actually working with on how we build these systems for them. And so I would definitely look at this, assess them based on how are people feeling, both gut checks, what more do they need? and then work on making these prompts, and then the call out again to continuously share with each other. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, it, this one asks, so how would, you, how would your position be that working online, it's okay to not have the same standards as in-person interactions? If so, would you say that will change as people are more comfortable online? So the feelings of being overwhelmed and trying to just catch up subside. Whew, okay. I, I can't help but feel um, this is a really hard time in the world. And I'm, I'm holding myself to a different standard with everything I do. And I'm showing up differently than everything I do. I'm, I'm heavier, I'm tired. Um, my, my reactions to things are constantly changing. Uh, between um, the deep racism uh, that exists within uh, North America, consistently focusing on indigenous rights, thinking about things like elections. I'm scattered and I wanna just call that out because I don't think we can hold ourselves to the standards 
that we have an in-person reactions at any point. I'm holding myself to standards to where we are in the world today, and that looks totally different. And so I do think that that's some sort of understanding and empathy that we need to think about. But as people come online, as things change, there will be some adapting and some change, but there's gonna to be totally new problems. Whether it's first year students who are continuously coming, who are always in this sort of, I don't know what's going on sort of mode. Um, this is something that's gonna keep coming up and we're gonna keep feeling overwhelmed. And I think we only get through that together. We only get through that when we start to have a feel of, you know, we're getting somewhere, we feel like we're doing the processes and we're sharing it. And so I do think at some point we're gonna stop this sort of catch up game where things feel a little bit more comfortable, but I think we have to be really, really empathetic with ourselves that it's okay to be there right now and to be sharing that openly and communicating and talking to others about how we shift those powers and dynamics. Okay, I'm definitely at time. So thank you so much again for participating, for coming, for joining. And I, I really can't wait to, to get to know more of this community and talk more. Thank you so much, Mira, from all of us here at eCampus for your insights, experience, examples, and ways to take action. Thanks so much for sharing today. So if everyone wants to just hop back into the agenda, you can head to the next session. Thank you.